Good evening and welcome to OMA EPC and our midweek Bible study. I hope you've enjoyed this beautiful day. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to the letter to the Hebrews and to the 10th chapter where we're going to read from verse 19 through to verse 25. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 19. Let us hear the word of God. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this evening. Let's turn briefly to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we do indeed thank you for your many mercies to us today. We thank you for the beauty of creation that we have seen during the course of today. And we thank you that when we look around at the world that you have made, we have reason to praise your name. But Father, as we come together around the scriptures this evening, we know that we have even greater reason to praise you. And we have greater reason to praise you because of Christ. Lord, we thank you for that great gift that you have given to us in him. We thank you for all the riches of grace that we enjoy this evening. And as we turn to your book, a book that speaks of Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would indeed bless your word to our hearts and souls. We pray that through the work of your spirit, that your, work would live, your word would live, and O Lord, that it would bring light and life to our needy souls. Lead us and guide us this evening, we pray, because we ask it, in the Saviour's name. Amen. When we were at school, it's sometimes difficult, isn't it, to make the link between what we are studying and our future. Uh, that's particularly the case if we're in the midst of exams and we're sweating over preparation for those exams and then we have the stress of taking the exams and sometimes it's difficult to make the link between what we're doing and our future. It's difficult to make the link between studying English and maths and French and biology and what we ultimately want to do in the future. And interestingly, we face a similar struggle in the Christian life, in the sense that sometimes it's difficult to make the link between Christian doctrine and practical Christian living. It's difficult to join up the dots between the two. Now, the interesting thing is that Scripture recognizes this difficulty. And what we often find, and this is particularly true of the letters, is we find a doctrinal section to begin with, and then that doctrinal section is followed by a practical section. In other words, Scripture helps us to see how doctrine applies to the Christian life. 
And we have this in the letter to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, through to chapter 10 and verse 18, we have an in-depth theological argument. And in that in-depth theological argument, the writer of Hebrews shows wavering Jewish believers that Christ is better in every sense, that Christ is better than what has gone before. Christ is better than the angels. Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than Aaron and the old Levitical system. Now, the point of transition in Hebrews comes at the point of chapter 10 and verse 19. From chapter 10, verse 19 onwards, the goal of the writer is to make the link between theory and practice. He begins to show how the doctrine of the opening nine chapters or so applies and relates to the nitty-gritty of living for Christ. Now, what I want us to do this evening is to take a look at an interesting passage, chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, Now, in chapter 10, verses 19 to 21, we have what we could describe as a summary of the first nine or so chapters, uh, in which we're told that we have access to God and that we have a great high priest. And then in what follows in verses 22 to 25, we have three let us statements, Uh, three let us statements that come in quick succession. And as we have these three let us statements, the writer to the Hebrews draws our attention to three specific areas. And what I want us to do just for a short time this evening is to look closely at these let us statements and these three areas that the writer to the Hebrews draws our attention to. The first is worship. This great theological argument of Hebrews helps us to worship. In fact, it positively encourages us to worship. Take a look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What are we to do this evening? We are to draw near. We are to come into the presence of God. The old barriers have gone And we can now come before him. And I want you to notice that within this command to draw near, we're given four guidelines to worship. The first one is sincerity. We are to draw near with a true heart. As we come into the presence of God, we are to come with a sincere and undivided heart, a heart that has the right priorities and the right affections, a heart that is, if you like, given over to God. So there is sincerity. But sincerity isn't the only thing. There's also assurance. We are to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Yes, we are to come, and we are to come with a sincere heart, but we're also to come with a believing heart, a heart that rests completely upon God 
and his promises. So there's sincerity and there's assurance. There's also to be a clean conscience. We are to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. We are to come with a heart that has been sprinkled with the blood of Christ which unlike the blood of sacrificial animals is able to cleanse the conscience of guilty fears. So there's sincerity, there's assurance, and there is a clean conscience. And lastly, there are washed bodies. We are to draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, what's in view here? Well, uh, many believe that what's in view here is water baptism. But like Calvin, I tend to think that the writer actually has something else in mind. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25 and 26, we're told this. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What is in view here is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we are to draw near to God in worship. And as we draw near to God in worship, we are to come relying upon his work and trusting in his ability to cleanse and to renew us. This is how we are to come, with sincerity, assurance, a clean conscience, and wash bodies. Now perhaps you're wondering whether it's even possible for us to come into God's presence like this. Well, it is possible, and it's intimately linked with the great argument of Hebrews. Now, just take a look at verses 19 to 21. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Now remember, we said earlier that these verses, verses 19 to 21, are a summary of the entire argument. We have access to God and we have a great high priest. And it is on that basis that we are exhorted in the very next verse to draw near. Uh, Can you see what the writer to the Hebrews is saying? He's saying it is possible. It is possible to draw near. It is possible to draw near uh, to God in this way because of Christ. Now, of course, we can draw near to God privately. But bearing in mind what the writer to the Hebrews goes on to say in verses 24 and 25, it seems pretty clear that what is at the forefront of his mind is public worship, where collectively the people of God draw near. And what a glorious thing it is when the people of God draw near to God together. Uh, That's one of the things that has been brought home to us, hasn't it, during the period of lockdown. Just how precious it is to meet together, to see one another, 
and to come together into the presence of God. Now, sadly, even within evangelicalism, uh, there are some who have a very low view of public worship. But if the writer to the Hebrews were alive today, he would say to us, why on earth would you want to stay away? Uh, bearing in mind everything that I've said for thousands of years, uh, the vast majority of believers were kept at arm's length and God said to them thus far and no further. But now the barriers have gone. Now you enjoy all the privileges and you can draw near in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an awesome privilege to draw near to God collectively in worship. So how does theology and how does the great theological argument of Hebrews help us practically? Well, it positively encourages us to worship. The barriers are gone and we can come. We can come with our brothers and sisters in Christ into God's presence. So the first area and the first let us is worship. The second area is truth. The great theological argument of Hebrews positively encourages us to contend for the truth. Take a look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, the word confession, as it is in the ESV, or profession, as it is in the authorized version, is a word that means public and doctrinal confession. What is in view here is that body of truth concerning Christ and his cross. That body of truth which is built upon God's promise and which is the foundation of our hope or our faith. And it is that body of truth to which we are to hold fast. What is in view here is the essentials of the Gospels. Not those secondary issues that sometimes divide Christians, but the essentials, the central truths of the gospel of grace. Now, sadly, uh, truth is under attack in our day. Uh, and perhaps most disturbingly, the truth is under attack uh, within our own uh, ranks. Uh, we're used to liberals and atheists attacking the truth, but now even those who call themselves evangelicals are attacking the truth. There are evangelicals who deny the substitutionary work of Christ upon the cross. Uh, there are evangelicals who now question whether the Reformation was actually necessary. And reject the idea that a man or a woman is justified through faith alone in Christ alone. They think that the reformers misunderstood Paul and the gospel. Now these are not secondary issues. These are things that go to the very heart of the gospel. And however alluring those siren voices may be. The writer to the Hebrews is telling us that we are to hold fast the confession of our hope. There can be no compromise. There can be no compromise on the essentials of the gospel of grace. Now, of course, there were siren voices in the 
the day in which the writer to the Hebrews was writing. There were those who were saying to the struggling Jewish believers in Rome that they should return to the old Judaism and that it was possible for a man or a woman to be right with God through the sacrifices offered in the temple in Jerusalem. But in the opening chapters of this letter, the writer to the Hebrews has shown his readers that Christ and Christ alone has offered the once and for all sacrifice for sin and that Christ and Christ alone make sinners right with God. And that is an issue upon which they could not compromise and that is an issue upon which we cannot compromise. Because to compromise on the essentials of the gospel is to destroy the gospel. You see, again, there is a, a direct link between theology and, and practical Christian living. Not only does the great argument of Hebrews uh, encourage us to worship, but it encourages us to contend for the truth. And by natural consequence, to proclaim that truth. So the first area is worship. And the second area is truth. The third area is community. This great theological argument of Hebrews positively encourages us to build a loving community. Now, uh, it's interesting uh, that one of the things that has characterized the 20th century and now the 21st century is the disintegration of communities. And we see that at all kinds of different levels. We see that in family life, community life, National life, we see families falling apart, people no longer know who their neighbours are, people no longer have a, a shared identity. Um, individualism is king in the modern world. Uh, interestingly, last week I heard a debate on uh, the radio as to whether or not lockdown has changed that, whether... Uh, lockdown has reinvigorated uh, the idea of community. Um, I'll let you decide uh, what you think. But one thing is clear, that in this individualistically-minded world, there is to be one group of people who are bucking the trend. Believers or to be actively building a loving community. Look at verses 25, 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, uh, the verbs in these uh, two verses are very interesting. Firstly, we are to consider one another. Now, our natural inclination uh, is to think about ourselves and our own wants and needs. But as believers, we are to think about others. Uh, is that person discouraged? Is that person struggling? Is that person being tempted? What can I do to, to help this person or that person in their difficulties? Uh, now, this isn't a warrant uh, for being a busybody, but it is encouraging us to be a caring 
community. We're to be considerate people who consider one another. So we are to consider others. Secondly, we are to stir up one another. Now, uh, this verb, to stir up, is particularly interesting because it's, it's a very strong word. It means to, um, to incite or to provoke. And in uh, other uh, uh, places, it, it actually has negative uh, connotations. But here, it has the idea of stimulating someone. Uh, perhaps as you consider the needs of others, you, you come across a, a believer, and, and it's obvious that their, their love and zeal are beginning to wane. And so as you begin to think about them, you begin to think about ways that you can stir them up. It might be a simple word of encouragement. It might be the extending of a bit of loving hospitality. Or it may simply be by setting a better example for them to follow. But whatever it is, not only are we to consider one another... But we are to stir up one another. And thirdly, we are to encourage one another. Now, to encourage someone, you need to get alongside them. Uh, it may be, uh, uh, or it may mean uh, bearing uh, their burden. It, it may mean praying for them. It may mean being a friend to them or helping them to better understand the implications of the gospel. But whatever it is, we are to encourage one another. And all of this, all of this flows out of our shared experience of the gospel. Because we have all been cleansed through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and because we all share the same high priest, we are to strive to build a loving community. Particularly because we know, as the writer to the Hebrews tells us, that the Lord Jesus Christ will one day come again. And there is a particular relevance of this for us as we come out of lockdown, isn't there? Uh, hopefully there will not be a third wave. Hopefully as we come out of this period of lockdown, we will return to some degree of normality. But as we get back to living uh, as a community of believers, both in this church and other churches. But as we get back into living as a community, we are to think of these three areas. These three areas that the writer to the Hebrews has highlighted that we are to consider one another, we are to stir up one another, and we are to encourage one another. As we come out of lockdown, we are to be a loving community. And again, that surely will be a witness to the wider world. Because again, many, many people, in fact, I was only speaking to somebody this afternoon who has been struggling uh, with the whole uh, idea of lockdown and of being shut away and... and uh, struggling with making the adjustment of coming out of lockdown. Well, surely there is a role here for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to provide a loving community where there are those who look out for one another, but most of all, where the glorious gospel of grace, the life-transforming gospel of grace 
is proclaimed. You see, there is a direct link. There is a direct link between the great doctrines of the Christian faith that centre upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done, and practical Christian living. And we're to take that doctrine and we're to live it out in these ways in our lives. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for who he is and for what he has done. We thank you especially for his blood that cleanses us from all sin and for the access that we now have through him into your presence. We pray, O Lord, that we would take these glorious truths to heart but that we would also be enabled to put these great doctrines into practice, that we would be able to work work them out in our daily lives, both as individuals, but particularly as a community of your people in this place. Lord, hear our prayer and bless your word to us this evening, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.